Hey everybody, welcome back to another week of Chasing Frets, and uh, and here we have my co-host Joe Gore. How you doing, Joe? Pretty well, considering, and uh, uh, pretty buzzed about talking to Molly Miller. I know we, every week we say this one's really special, <laughs> <laughs> but she is just a she's just a blast to hang out with. She's a fascinating figure. She uh, she sometimes goes by the name Doctor Molly Miller because she has a PhD from USC in jazz guitar performance. Uh, and she is the guitar chair at the Los Angeles College of Music. But she's not just some academic geek. She's she's Jason Mraz's lead guitar player. And um, and even though if you were forced to put her in a box, it would probably be the jazz box. Um, she just plays such an unlikely assortment of tunes. It's just a grab bag of pop and rock and, you know, everything from Beyonce to the Carter family. And, uh, mm. you know, she's a bit, she's a, you know, uh, a guitar historian and uh, incredible breadth of style and uh, just a, a really, a real player's player. And as you'll see, she's, um, she's pretty fun to talk to as well. Yeah. She was super fun. I first met her, she was coming through town with Jason and we ended up uh, about half of Jason's band, uh, including Molly. We, we filmed a couple of videos for premier guitar and, and did an interview and, and stuff. And then my wife and I went out to the show that, that night and his band, the super band, it's like a 10 piece band. It's, it's, and it, it was just, it was incredible. And, and how she talks about these choreographed moves and she got all these, you know, hip, cool guitar solos, you know, on these pop tunes. And it was, it was quite a, quite a show to, to be able to check her out. But today's uh, topic is uh, one that, when she brought it up, you immediately jumped on. That's talking about Sister Rosetta Tharp. Oh well, that's a that's you know yeah that's a that's a great area of passion for me. Uh, she's just such a even even with all the recognition that she's gotten in the last few years as her music has become more accessible via YouTube videos, still isn't getting the credit she deserves. I mean, it's not that much of an exaggeration to say she um, you know she's the creator of rock and roll guitar. And a yeah. lot of what a lot of what we think of as fifties rock and roll guitar, you know, she was doing before World War II. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's true. That's uh, absolutely the evidence is right there on YouTube, folks. Uh, <laughs> so and, that's uh, that's a fun sec. That's a fun segment. And it was an interesting point you brought up, where it was like she kind of became Sister Rosetta, kind of became more well known because of YouTube. You know, because her actual studio recordings are, you know, hit and miss as far as completeness or whatever can be hard to find because the various record labels she recorded with but there's all this really hip footage on youtube that people can dig into and then go off and explore on their own yeah it doesn't take you know it's you know there's not like one master compilation box set that you need to get though there should be but yeah. uh oh man spent spent 10 minutes on youtube with you know you know just type in her name and the first few videos that come up will probably be some of the great ones. She had a long career. I mean, she was a big star in the 1930s and she, you know, she performed all the way through the sixties and most of what you'll see is probably from the early sixties and when she's a middle-aged woman, but um, she's doing stuff that she was, was doing when she was, when she was very young and back before she was sister and she was still singing raunchy songs. <laughs> well, I uh, hope you guys enjoy this episode with Molly, and uh, so we'll hop right to it as we talk about uh, Sister Rosetta Tharp. <laughs> Molly, thank you so much for, for hanging out with us this week. How are you? I'm so good. It's so good to see your faces. Oh, man. We are, we are so happy to have you uh, hang with us this week on, on Chasing Frets, and um this today's topic kind of brought me back to the first time we kind of connected and I uh, begged, pleaded uh, with you to take, to get, to take, to write a lesson for us. And um, that lesson, it was like one of the very first ideas you came up with is like, can I write something on Sister Rosetta? Yeah. And I'm like, yes, 100%. And I got to say, that's one there's a few lessons we have I've done over the last couple of years that people will just kind of like either forward me and say, Hey, I really like this. Or, or even Joe mentioned, we would be in a planning session for this podcast. He, he brought up that lesson, which led to, yeah, let's have her on the podcast, but tell me, well, first also great lesson on that, on, on sister Rosetta that you wrote. Thank but you. Tell me what kind of your first uh, memory of, of discovering her was because I got to admit I it took your lesson to really help me understand her. Yeah, it was in grad school. So, 
I had heard of her and and like seen some footage, you know, like the classic footage of her in the 60s when she goes to plays on the train station in, in the UK. Um, but it when I was finishing my doctorate, I did a thesis on the pioneering women of the guitar. And I was like, so anything, I was like, there's all these incredible female guitar players that we don't really study. And they changed the way we played guitar. And it was Memphis Mini. And, um, you know, I did and uh, Mabel Carter, and then Sister Rosetta Tharp. And Sister Rosetta Tharp stood out to me. She was the one I connected with at, on so many levels. She, I And she deeply, deeply influenced the way I played guitar. So I studied her music. I read her, her documentary. I watched everything I could on her. And I, f- I fell in love with her. I was completely obsessed and enamored by her, the way she played the instrument, the way she lived her life so boldly, and the way she, she really changed the way that we – conceptualized guitar playing could couldn't agree more and also just just before we hit record we were talking about guitar and about the the loss of ed van halen which was just two days ago at the time we recorded this and um we got into a discussion about who tuned who who introduced the idea of tuning down and we were saying well so and so did it before so and so and eddie did it before stevie ray vaughn and Jimi hendrix did it before eddie but we're kind of leaving somebody out of that conversation, aren't we? Oh, big time. I know. As you, I know. I'm like, duh. Sister is at a third. She played a minor third down for a lot of her stuff. Not uh, just standard minor third down? Yeah. Like okay. everything I transcribed of hers, I would like watch videos and and it, it would, yeah, she would tune a minor third down and shred and do double stops and do slides and play rock and roll before rock and roll existed. You know, this was like 30s, 40s guitar playing Pre Chuck Berry, and it's and she invented rock guitar. I, I, I playing. couldn't agree more. And a lot of what we think of as as Chuck Berry guitar is stuff that she was doing in the 1930s. Totally, even like even the pre electric like stuff, kitschy things like the yeah. Well, I was going to say like everyone thinks uh, like the the pinwheel, you know, um, like she invented that. Like when you like swing your your hand around, she was not just like an incredible player, but a showman. And like truly a showman at the end of her life, she had diabetes and both of her, she lost both of her legs or maybe, and I would like read story. No, actually it was when she had one leg. Uh, And I read some accounts of her playing and like jumping up on one leg with her guitar and just like going for it. But this is the history of her whole life. When she was a kid, she was in the uh, church of God in Christ. She was really a big part of that community. She was a superstar in the church. And um, she was known for her her performing for her performances. She was like jumping on pianos, and uh, yeah, that's where it started for her, like the showmanship oh, aspect. For, for sure, and that's kind of an ongoing thing because a lot of rock historians uh, misattribute uh, where a lot of that showmanship started, and that was just kind of yeah. you know um, you know certainly with what you know with with black vaudeville or what was what they called the Chitlin circuit back in the day. And in the church, mm-hmm. you had this tradition of flamboyant showmanship. And people would say, you know, Jimi Hendrix was invented playing guitar with your teeth. And um, no, I mean, T-Bone Walker was doing that in the 40s. I mean, th- these were old, you know, yeah. these were people playing to tough audiences and, um, you know, using every trick in the book to, to you know, command the stage. And a lot of those, what we think of as rock and roll traditions, um, go pretty far back. It didn't all start in the 50s. Totally. They started in the church is like the thing that's so cool, you know, it's like being a performer in the church and dancing and singing and moving and playing instruments and how, uh, and then it's interesting how then it segued to the stage. And then our American conception of what showmanship, where it started was, is not, it's not, we don't remember that it started in the church. But to, well, it's, I mean, you could make a darn good musicological argument that um, rock and roll is really just uh, African American church music with secular lyrics. Yeah, which is it's sister is at a which third. is literally true in some cases. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, like Ray Charles, I got a woman. Yeah, yeah, and sister is at a third. She was really one of the early people to do that. I think that was there's a there's a lot of reasons why she got overlooked, and um, I, I you you guys were both lucky enough to discover her when you were young. I w- I was much farther along in life before I realized her genius. And because I've been writing for guitar magazines so long, I, I really do feel a great deal of guilt about um, not 
giving her her due, um, you know, before I realized how primal she was. Yeah. I know. It's a funny thing. And I'm always trying to figure out, like, why exactly when she was so influential? Was it just like not always guitar enough? You know, when we think of our guitar heroes, because like guitar shredding is present in her playing, but some of it is like she's a she's a front woman, you know, she's singing for Lucky Millinder's band. And maybe people forget that she's just she's a shredder, too. It's, I mean, I think it's, well, speaking is a, speaking is a, you know, middle-aged white dude from California. I think for me, part of it was that, oh, she's a gospel performer. Mm. And in the, and also, part, and so, you know, I think it was like, you know, without even consciously thinking it, I think it was sort of ruling it out because I was thinking in terms of secular music. Yeah. I think there's sexism and racism involved. Yeah. And, um, but a big part too is YouTube, you know, like, those tracks were really hard to find. You would have to, you know, 20, 30 years ago, you would have to be a gospel record collector, you know, to know how good that stuff was. Yeah. And today you can just say, hey, have you checked out Rosetta Tharp and go look at, um, you know, Didn't It Rain or um, especially uh, Up Above My Head. Yeah. Uh, That's the famous clip where she's backed by a gospel choir who are all clapping and yeah. she's just she's just playing her, uh, pardon the expression, ass off. Oh, yeah. And um you know, now you can, you can, in 30 seconds, you can say, oh my God, she's so important. Yeah. There's so many great clips of her down by the riverside and whatnot. Um, yeah. But like when falling. Oh, in, that's so good. Isn't it great with the, there's actually like, there's a, the, the clip for that. It's like the blind boys of Alabama. They, I think that for some, there was a clip, I think they all played the same day. Cause there's a clip on YouTube I found where she does a, a, a like promo for an, a laxative and then Blind Boys sing, and then she performs. I forget what the exact order is, but they're all on one YouTube clip. And I'm, she's like, like whatever, like whatever the brand is. She's like, it helps. That was Louis, Louis Armstrong did laxative commercials for a lot of his life too. I know it cracks me up. But I was gonna say, like one falling in love with her. Like so much of it is not just her guitar playing, because definitely the way she played her guitar changed the way I played guitar. You know, the chromaticism and changed the way everyone played guitar. And but like. I consciously, re- I ch- I think I a, my playing shifted when I got so deep into her, um, and I think it, it it ties really closely to her character as well because she lived her life the way she played the guitar, which is this like bold irreverence, this uh, the confidence she has in who she is, what she's doing, being forward thinking, like you know playing with an integrated band when that wasn't allowed. She was one of the first people to have a, a tour bus that said her name in big letters. Um, yeah, she just did all these things where she was just like, you know what, this I'm I'm sisters at a tharp. Screw you. This is how I'm going to live. This is how I'm going to play. This And yeah, there's something so um, exhilarating about her and the way she played and lived her life. And there is, a, I mean, there is a de- direct connection to early rock and roll because we latter-day rock and rollers, a lot of us, um, were late to realize how great she was. Mm-hmm. But um a lot of you know the, the Sun Records crowd wasn't, you know, El, you know she was she was a big favorite of Elvis. Speaking at Jordanaires, uh, she her backing band were the Jordanaires, who Elvis later stole oh, from I her. I didn't know that. Yes, yeah, she called wow. them her four little white babies. <laughs> <laughs> and then also, also little Richard is was on the record as saying that he copied her haircut. Really, my understanding is he wanted his hair. You wanted his hair to look like hers. That's so funny. Uh, and and I've read this, and who knows what's real and what's folklore. But his first live performance was a Sisters at a Tharp show. Believable. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So you have your guitar in your hands there, Molly, and oh, you yeah. wrote your thesis on uh, or partly uh, including Sister Rosetta. So, like for people who listen to this podcast, can you play a little bit, kind of in her style, so they can give an idea uh. about. What uh, when you talk about she laid the foundation for all these parts, I'd be willing to bet you could probably play something that, at this point, not sounds cliche, but has become a cliche just because she invented it. It's been around in our voca- our guitar vocabulary for so long. Oh yeah, I'll take it slow, but first, but then I can play a faster kind of lick phrase of hers. But all the like slidey double stop stuff, like. <laughs> And, you know, like guiding changes, playing changes, outlining changes while still like playing rock and roll. So here's like A, A7, D, D minor. It's like. Like all that kind of stuff she was doing in the 40s. And this, I love the glisses you did or so or so her. Yeah. And all like the big, you know, like all that kind of stuff where she's like making these big sweeps. 
Um, that was maybe a little too jazzy at the end with that da 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 da, but that sort of vein of just like sliding up the guitar, chromaticism, like. <laughs> Like that kind of, like the, the chromaticism, the slides, the double stops, and the mixing with big chords and um, the smaller lines as well. Yeah. Lovely she, summary. She is a Yeah, you popped her pretty good there. Oh, I, she stole my heart. Yeah. She's, I mean, she's such a charisma. I mean, she's just, uh, if you, if anyone hasn't seen her, you know, she's doing this amazing guitar stuff while being one of the best vocalists you've ever heard in your life and being totally. just a... A, a, a just a incandescent superstar on stage. She just had her physical presence is so commanding. Oh yeah. Like, so, um, it was her third marriage. They got, she got married and what is this? She got married in a baseball stadium and I'm maybe you and I'm not a baseball person and I can't remember what the stadium is, but it's like some iconic baseball stadium. Like her career wasn't doing quite as well. So they decided to do this like big show. And, um, she was, they chose, they said they were her. So they record, made an album that was a wedding. And so like at a stadium, so it was packed and everyone brought gifts and she didn't even know who her husband was going to be until like a couple weeks before. Um, and like that was the person she married and was married to till the end of her life, who was like her manager as well. I just um, did you is, did you is a lot of your information come uh, uh, the the great um, uh, Americana music musicologist um, uh, Gail Wald wrote a, wrote uh, Shout Sister Shout yeah. Untold Story of Rosetta Tharp. Is that your source for some of this, or did you glean the info? Um, are there other good sources where you can read up on her history? I was like obsessively read everything I could on her and watched everything I could on her. So I read that book and then there's a documentary and I think I even just like watched it on YouTube and they interview, you know, her old friends, her childhood friends, people from the church, different musicians, um, and every article that I could find on her an interview and video. So it's hard for me at this point to know what is from what source. Cause now it's just like, I just, I just, I just know her. Where can I read your thesis, Molly? That's it was a lecture recital actually, so it wasn't even uh. written. I I have like inco, I have like pages and pages of incoherent notes, and I I in the notes I should find them. It says like where what sources from, um, but then I just did, and actually even after I finished my doctorate, I did a few shows on the pioneering women of the guitar, and I did a show uh. of just like sisters at a Tharp music because. While I, Memphis Minnie and Maybell Carter, I adore, um, there was something about Sister Rosetta Tharp that I just connected with on so many levels. Breaking down kind of the elements of her style, she tuned down. Not, yeah, and she I don't even think always, just a lot, some of the videos I saw, she, and I'm- I, A lot of the most popular clips, she's, she's down there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. She plays with a thumb pick. God, I don't, now I'm, now that you're saying it, I can't. I don't remember. I think I I remember. What's the one with her playing the white SG? The one. It's a black and white. That's didn't it video. rain? I thought. Well, she's I, I assume. I mean, there's, there's a bunch. These clips keep turning up, but I'm assuming you mean yeah. the train station, mm -hmm. the train station one, where she's wearing this big house coat out in the cold, standing on this train station. Yeah, that. And yeah, yeah. It sounds like she's plugged straight into the PA. Yeah. Um, because yeah. the the tone is really kind of needles and pins, but kind of awesome in a way. Yeah. And and, uh, it's also you know just the. The, the place in history, too, because that this famous clip of Didn't It Rain, which you can find on YouTube, um, it's later in her career. She's a middle-aged woman, and it's from 65, 64. Um, and it's, it's, she's playing before, you know, a very young, seemingly all-white audience. Yes. And they, it, you cut to the audience, and A, they're digging it, but B, they're, their jaws are dropping. Yeah. And it just like, you know, I just think, like, how many, how many future British rock stars are there in that audience getting their mind blown. Yeah. You know, at this one, at this one concert. God, I almost want to find it. I know I have it in my notes, but like there's a good quote about Bob that Bob Dylan has about that exact thing where like he changed all these, like, I, 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 I can try to find it. Well, you mentioned when you were playing that example, there was a fast one you had in mind. A fast what? Fast example, playing example. You said you're going to start slow and then play oh, fast. Oh, I was one. just like, yeah. Oh, just that concept where I was going to explain it. Um, but it was like, that's, it's like, I, I transcribed her doing, um, just a closer walk with thee. Mm. And it was 
I think down a minor third, but it was that kind of thing. I think it may have even been a live video. I can't remember. Oh, I can't remember. I can't remember what's from what to tell you the truth. Um, <laughs> made my own thing at the end but yeah that's like all no that's all, and, yeah, God, yeah. I, I love hearing you play that stuff there's uh, there's um you know again for like you know american music history geeks the the one that blows my mind is just this little throwaway moment um from the 1938 spirituals to swing concert and that's a very important concert uh you know moment in jazz history because legendary um uh, producer John Hammond yeah. put on this concert at Carnegie Hall with a lot of uh, blues and folk and um, uh, jazz artists. Yeah. And it was kind of the first time, you know, that, that um, you know, mainstream, you know, white culture really presented African-American music in a respectful environment that it you know, it, that it deserved. It wasn't just about the, the you know, the bars and the roadhouses. Yeah. And uh, she plays a set with Albert Ammons, mm -hmm. the famous boogie woogie pianist. And so they're playing, you know, when, when he's playing boogie woogie, it's like rock and roll. I mean, it's not, there's, it, it, it isn't swing. He's, you know, he's playing, you know, you know, beat me daddy eight to the bar. Yeah. And they do, they do as, and, and at that point she was still singing secular songs in her repertoire. So she kind of sang ranch, raunchy songs at one point. And yeah. she's kind of a raunchy performer, even oh. when she's being, you know, even when she's doing gospel music. I want a tall, skinny papa and, uh, rock me. Yeah. <laughs> but they start, they start to go into uh, play That's All. And she's on acoustic guitar and it sounds like they're going to start it. And then she launches into a lick and it's kind of a false start. And then they start playing it together. But her little throwaway lick sounded really similar to what you just played a minute ago. Oh. And that, it's like 1938, folks. You know, like rock and roll did not start in the fifties. Totally, she was she was playing rock and roll. All and yeah, her solo from um, uh, "Down by the Riverside." And the thing that's so cool, she's like it's sophisticated rock and roll because she is still like sometimes it's just you know like pentatonic blues, double stops, what we conceptualize as rock and roll, but also like hitting the changes. And I think mm -hmm. that's maybe why I was so drawn to her as well, is because you know I do have a lot of jazz in my background, so that the, the consciousness of where harmony what what harmony is happening and she was really aware of it but also like she was like hanging with duke ellington and stuff in the 30s you know you were uh, you, we, we're on video and and you listeners aren't but when i said something about her being a raunchy performer molly started <laughs> nodding her head i mean how would you just i mean just, how would you describe just how she presented her trip? it was so it was, it was she was like, i'm a sexy i'm a sexy woman you know and it was in her lyrics and how she even like the, she said her lyrics too was like rock me you know it wasn't like oh rock me and rock me it comes from a spiritual song and i forget the original lyrics but it's a song about like loving jesus and she's like rock me all night long baby you know <laughs> it's like i want a tall skinny papa hey you know like the way she says it you know what she's saying and like she's hamming it up so hard and knows it's like she knows she holds the power and is loving that you know, because she and she still did, and she still did it as an older woman yeah, too. It's a superpower that she has, being this per amazing performer, being this insanely influential, just an, an insane guitar player, a singer, and just a woman. And she like she leaned into it, and she also was bisexual too. Like you know, was touring with her lover. Uh, it like she was so ahead of her time. No, there's a poster I've seen that says, "Don't forget that rock and roll was invented by a clear, queer black woman." <laughs> Awesome. And uh, it's it's a bit of an overstatement, but <laughs> um, but she deserves some overstatement after not getting the respect. What yeah. about the one trick? She, she does this one show stopping mm. thing, and it's you know it's one of her gimmicks, and it's it's usually like in the last chorus of a solo, and she'll uh, hit a like kind of a dissonant quarter tone mm -hmm. double stop bend. Uh, I think it's, I think she just does it on beat two and holds it, and then she'll swing her arm around yeah. or she'll sh shimmy her substantial upper torso totally or um you know it's just it's yeah the pin 
and it's it's an it's an amazing sound. I I cannot figure out how to reproduce. Yeah, it. I know a lot of the stuff when transcribing. I was like, good lord, like how am I going to do that? But yeah, the pinwheel that people say Pete Townsend made, created, she did. But yeah, and the way she moved her arms, she would like flail them. You know, she'd play something and be like, uh, a, and like fly her arms into the air. Yeah. It was like she dramatized everything and I am a sucker for that kind of thing. You know, it's like, if anyone see, like, I like to move and perform and I feel like she made me remember it. Not only is it okay, but it like adds to the fun. Like, and that's what I think she all, not only like the boldness, but she's like, she is having fun up there. You know, we're going to talk about melody later in this week, but, um, Molly speaks the truth. She, you know, in addition to, you know, playing with her trio and, you know, doing session work and teaching, uh, she's Jason Mraz's lead guitar player. And there's some, there's some live performances of her with the group on YouTube that you can find. And she's not standing still looking like a jazz nerd. Molly's putting on a rock and roll show and, you know, and jumping and bouncing. Oh, the Matrix but, moves. The Matrix moves you all did. The choreographed oh, that Matrix was moves fun. just killed me. I, I know. Like that, Jason <laughs> let us do all. Like, I was really excited when Jason was like, I forget who. I think it was like some of the reigning Jane girls and I were all like, yeah, let's add some choreography into this. Because it's like, to me, it's fun. Uh, but like, when I was a kid, the thing that made me fall in love with guitar and realize how amazing it is was Jimi Hendrix. I'm like 13 years old. And I used to, when I would perform, I grew up playing with my four siblings and I would perform and I'd do like back bends and play with my teeth and like I'd go on my knees and play guitar. And like when I was like in middle school and I thought it was the most fun. And then I got into jazz in high school and I was like, oh no, you're not supposed to do that. You're supposed to stand still. So it has been this progression of like what you're allowed to. And then just being like, screw it like this. And I feel like sister Rosetta Tharp was a part of the evolution of like, yeah, but your Trump, but your Trump card is, you know, you are putting on a, you know, a very extroverted rock show, yeah. but like you are playing really intelligently and um, focused, you know, you're not just going into like, you know, one note pull offs while you raise your, you know, raise your arm. It's like you're playing this very sophisticated long line while rocking out. It's um, it's impressive. It's fun. This has been such a such an education for me today with hearing everybody talk about Sister Rosetta. But Molly, if there was a uh, other than the YouTube videos that we mentioned, which you just type in that, was there an album, a particular Sister Rosetta album that you think is a good starting spot for people who really want to? listen to more of her music that wasn't caught on film? It's hard because I just like scoured, you know, Spotify. Um, there's like a Shout Sister Shout record. There's a lot of her early stuff. To me, like it's not one album because the the trajectory of her career is so cool. Hearing what she's doing early on on acoustic guitar and like hearing how her playing progressed, um, you know, when she was more acoustic to more electric. So – it's hard for me to be like definitely listen to just this one thing because I fell in love with. It's kind of it's kind of a mess, you know. There yeah. really isn't a proper retrospective. Yes, she was also. It's legally problematic because I guess she was signed to different labels, mm -hmm. so you can get this fantastic looking compilation, but it'll just be the records from a couple of consecutive years. Yeah, um, I think I, I I don't know what what if Molly agrees, but I think the best way is I think the best entry is is YouTube. Me too. And of course, you you could just see what a magnificent performer yeah. she was. Yeah, and also we did. I remember. One of the, I think it's, I've only been working at Premier Guitar for a little over a year. We did a long form, like Forgotten Heroes type thing on Sister Rosetta. Uh, oh, cool. That's, that was kind of, that was the first time I really learned about her. And then strangely enough, my band was going through Nashville once and we were crashing at John Bollinger's house and I was sleeping on his couch and I woke up and then there's like this big Sister Rosetta poster hanging above his couch in his living room you can see that in most yeah, of his videos it's <laughs> right there. It's, you look at any of his gear demos and there's it's there's right sister there. rosetta looking so. over his shoulder oh, that's so cool well, well thank you molly so much for hanging with us this week everybody go listen to sister rosetta as much as possible and uh, we'll be back later this week with more from uh, molly miller thanks for having me mm -hmm.